What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with Spider-Verse and you guys really seem to enjoy the last video that we did. So we're going to do more. Uh, this one in particular is very, very interesting. So here's one thing that I want to preface before we, we get into this. There are a few things going on within the Marvel universe and multiverse at the same time this is happening and that actually lead up to it. Specifically the events of infinity. So basically Thanos fighting the Inhumans and the Terrigen bomb, as well as the incursions. We'll explain that once we get to it. But the other thing is that following this, we're going to jump into Edge of Spider-Verse. And Edge of Spider-Verse is where you get a lot of the origins you guys have been asking for, right? So like the origin of Spider-Gwen, different things like that. So we'll kind of bring all that stuff together. And then once Edge of Spider-Verse finishes, we'll get into the actual main Spider-Verse event because this is all prelude stuff. <laughs> this is all the stuff leading up to quote unquote, the main Spider-Verse event. And so what this does is this actually focuses, at least in this video, we're going to be focusing on Amazing Spider-Man Volume 3. Now, the reason why that matters is because technically the events of Superior Spider-Man concluded they're done and when superior spider-man ended you went into amazing spider-man 3 which was basically peter parker getting his body back the reason why you still see superior spider-man is because prior to the ending of his story spider-verse took place so he was thrown into the multiverse he's currently outside of time so it's like dr octopus taking over the body of peter parker on a monday the entire spider-verse event happens on a tuesday and then on a wednesday peter gets his body back so it's just one of those one of those weird things right it's just something to wrap your head around I know it seems a little strange, but what this also does is it brings in a character named Cindy Moon. Now, Cindy Moon was a really, really cool concept that Marvel wasted, <laughs> and it really kind of sucked. So if you guys recall our discussion about the idea of spider totems, again, that was Marvel basically moving away from the idea that Peter Parker was just a kid who was bitten by a radioactive spider, and instead him being bitten by that spider basically tied him in to this kind of mystical uh, connection that he had with all these other people who had been bitten by spider spiders and become spider people. Now, one of the things that Marvel had did is they had an event called Original Sin. And all Original Sin did is it basically revealed all these things that we never knew about. It was a way for Marvel to kind of jumpstart stories they'd been looking to tell. And you learned some really, really cool stuff, right? Captain America being part of the Illuminati and then having his mind wiped and kicked out, different things along those lines. Sydney Moon was actually a girl who was bitten by the exact same spider that bit Peter Parker. And in fact, they happened within like minutes of each other. The spider bit Peter, it fell off, and then it bit Cindy on her ankle. The kicker to this is that if you recall our discussions about like Ezekiel Sims and all those guys, basically Ezekiel Sims realizing that like the inheritors were going around and killing people who were basically Spider-Man and Spider-Woman from across the multiverse, that when he encountered Cindy Moon and her power started manifesting, he realized that the inheritors were after her. And so what he did is he locked her away in what was basically a bunker that had years worth of food. Now, she wasn't a prisoner. She could have left at any point in time. She had the access code to leave. But Ezekiel Sims basically said, if you do that, there's a good chance they'll find you and they will kill you if they do, right? There's no way you can fight them off on your own. So she was more of a prisoner by choice than anything else. Following the events of Original Sin and Peter Parker learning of Cindy Moon's existence, he basically rescued her. And then there was like a whole series of events where she was pissed off. But because of the fact that she's part of the spider totems and she has the name The Bride, essentially her and Peter Parker just can't stop banging. That's really what it means. Like if they are in a vicinity of each other, like literally it happens here where like they're talking, he's showing her the internet and he was like, okay, when you were locked away, yeah, it was AOL and Netscape. For those of you guys who were that old to remember that kind of stuff, I do. I remember AOL. <laughs> <laughs> but he says like nowadays it's all Facebook and all that kind of stuff. They're literally within a foot of each other. The pheromones start kicking in and they want to start banging. And it happened for a while. When they first met, they couldn't stop banging. It was crazy. It was hilarious, but it was crazy. And so again, with Anna Maria Marconi being here, of course, again, her, she initially met Dr. Octopus believing he was Peter Parker. All that stuff took place during Superior Spider-Man. Then she's like, okay, no, we're not having you guys doing this. This is not going to happen. Uh, she starts literally starts spraying him with water and order to make him stop. <laughs> and so Cindy Moon finally gives up and she ends up basically taking off to find her own place. Now, following that, what you actually end up getting is this great big huge kind of calamity where you basically have Minerva. The reason why this matters is like Minerva fighting the cops and things like that. It's not overall important to the Spider-Verse event, but it is cool. And, and the weird thing is that Minerva is one of those characters Marvel just never really updated her. So to give you guys perspective, Minerva was a character who was basically a member of the Kree race. And she traveled to Earth to meet the original Captain Marvel of the Kree the guy, and then wanted to bang him in order to basically jumpstart the Kree's evolution. The reason why is because at one point in their history, the Kree had gotten their hands on something called the Crystal of Ultimate Vision, but because they 
wanted to use it for nefarious purposes, it basically froze their evolutionary state so they never aged. Marvel fixed that with a story called Operation Galactic Storm, where basically the Kree race was almost totally obliterated, and because of that, their evolution was forced, and so there really isn't a need for Minerva to exist anymore. That's why you see her here and there occasionally, but she never matters because Marvel never changed the motivation. It's like she never knew that Operation Galactic Storm happened, right? I don't know how she didn't know. She was there when it did, but nonetheless, it's one of those one of those weird little things. This matters because the whole situation with this going on with Minerva actually gets the attention of basically Kamala Khan, of Miss Marvel. And she's a great character. I love the character of Miss Marvel. Her basically stepping in and intervening actually leads to her and Spider-Man teaming up, which is cool. But Kamala Khan is one of these characters where she had basically come about as a result of the Terrigen bomb detonating. So prior to the events of what was going on here with Spider-Verse, what you had it was a story called Infinity, which was part of a larger story that dealt with the incursions. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But Infinity was really its own self-contained story. So you can read that of its own accord and actually not read anything else involving Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, and for the most part, be fine. You'll probably have to do a little bit of internet researching to kind of get caught up on some things that don't make sense. But the overall gist here is that Thanos had formed the Cole Obsidian and was basically traveling around the multiverse trying to find his offspring and kill them. That eventually led him to Earth, where he learned his child existed among the Inhumans. He ended up getting in a fight with Black Bolt, and in the conflict, one of the most amazing moments in the story. Dude, there's this amazing moment in Infinity. Dude, I, I love this moment. It's like one of the best moments ever, where like Thanos is fighting Black Bolt, and he was like, tell me where my son is, and Black Bolt's like, no, right? Like, anytime he talks, it's a quasi-sonic scream, so like, he basically, you know, just uh, emanates this massive amount of energy, like this huge concussive blast, and like, he's like screaming at Thanos, and it's not working, and Thanos is like, fine, keep your secrets, carry them with you to the grave, and like, smashes his head in the ground. It's just this ridiculously amazing moment. But in any event, uh, basically Black Bolt detonated the Terrigen Bomb, which spread Terrigenesis across the world. And then all these people who carry the inhuman genes and didn't know it, suddenly went into a state of Terrigenesis. Quite literally, they were just like kind of encased in these ugly looking cocoons. And then they would just manifest in whatever form it happened to take, right? Very similar to how mutants suddenly just develop powers based on their X gene, usually during like puberty or high levels of stress. But Kamala Khan is one of those. Now what made Kamala Khan so cool in her early stories by G. Willow Wilson is one, the family dynamic, right? The fact that she came from a very traditional family, but she actually wanted to do like very American things, which were considered to be very much against what her family stood for. But she was also like really new to the superhero scene. So like meeting heroes for the first time and then basically just fangirling, it was hilarious. <laughs> I love the original run of, of uh, Kamala Khan. And so that's why when like Spider-Man shows up, she's like, you're Spider-Man, holy cow. I'm gonna, I'm gonna team up with Spider-Man. This is amazing. And then she starts asking him stuff like, like, did you really go on a date with Miss Marvel with like Carol Danvers? Like, what was she like? What kind of music does she dig? She's like the ultimate Carol Danvers fangirl. But it was a it was a cool little thing. Of course, she really became, you know, kind of stepped into her own and became a more solidified character. But one of the things that Minerva's doing is that because she's trying to like jumpstart Kree physiology, she basically ends up taking this kind of inhuman and then seemingly bonding them with Kree DNA for the purpose of like allowing them to manifest and kind of go forward accordingly. What follows after this isn't really interesting at all. Um, they fight the thing and then they basically win and like the day's saved and you got some cool moments where some stuff happens. In all honesty, it's basically filler to justify the existence of the comic uh, to basically fill it up with space. One of the things that does happen here is you actually end up seeing Cindy Moon fashioning like an official costume for herself. Probably one of the more popular costumes that exists in the spider universe. But basically the, everything's kind of cool and everything's copacetic and you know, the day's saved and, and that's basically it. The meat and potatoes of this and the real takeaway from this comes by way of Spider UK. And again, these are the kind of backup features that you saw during these events of, of Spider-Man that largely dealt with uh, basically the Spider-Verse event kind of leading into the whole thing. And so what ends up happening here is that you basically have a, a kind of situation where Spider-UK almost has this kind of experience that like something's wrong in the multiverse involving the various Spider-Man. And in fact, he's actually using the ability to scan the multiverse to essentially figure all this stuff out. Now, there's a few things we have to explain in terms of why this happens. So Spider-UK is part of what's called the Captain Britain Corps, and his name is is Billy Braddock. So the Captain Britain Corps is a multiversal team. For those of you guys who are unfamiliar with this, if you guys know about it, bear with me here for a second. I feel like we're gonna get a lot of new viewers who have never heard of this before. The Captain Britain Corps is a multiversal superhero team. They're not particularly powerful, but take the Green Lanterns from like the DC Comics universe and make it a multiversal team. And 
that's basically the Captain Britain core. There's officially one Captain Britain for each universe. And what they have is something called the Lighthouse, which is like their base of operations, but it's also an interdimensional teleportation device. And it allows them to enter into what's called the Starlight Citadel. That's basically the base of operations for a woman named Saturnine, who's called the Omniversal Magistrix. Her job is to like monitor the multiverse and make sure things don't pop off. A lot of people do that. The Living Tribunal does that. Alteza, the custodian of the multiverse does that. And Saturnine does that. And then there's even more people who do that as well. But because of what's going on, because of the nature of the Starlight Citadel and even the nature of the lighthouse itself, there is technology there that allows members of the Captain Britain Corps to scan the multiverse and to see what's going on. Because of what use would they be as a team if they weren't able to like communicate with each other, different things like that. And so what ends up happening is Billy Braddock actually looks into an alternate reality, which is Earth 1983 in New York City, and basically sees that in that universe that Morlun is there and is actually killing one of the Spider-Men and absorbing their power, right? Taking this guy out. The crazy thing about this is this is seemingly a universe where things were basically just cool. No one really fought. It was pretty lighthearted. So this guy's overcome pretty easily because evil doesn't really seem to be something that exists. So quite literally, he's encountering something he's never encountered before. And so literally like all these folks are killed at the hands of Morlun and then that's it. Following that, he actually starts looking through all these different realities that you've got two of the other inheritors that we saw in the last video, the brother and sister, Bricks and Bora, who are actually killing one of the spider totems as a cat in this alternate universe. That you actually end up switching over to Deimos in Earth 7831. That guy is consuming actually an entire world full of anthropomorphic heroes, largely consisting of the Knights of Wondergore, which are basically uh, individuals who were created by the high evolutionary by basically modifying animal DNA. And they kind of spread out into the world and seemingly populated this world with anthropomorphic animals partly and then also baseline humans. While the inheritors themselves are only supposed to feed on spiders, if a being has superpowers and they are animal in nature, they're part of that animal totem system. So that's the reason why like Morlun fought Black Panther as an example. Uh, they can feed on those, but by, by way of the instruction given to them by their father, they're not supposed to. They're only supposed to feed on spider totems. The other thing about this is you actually have Genix, who's, who's kind of like the scientific arm of the inheritors, who actually realizes that, that Billy Braddock is spying on them, that this Spider-Man UK is watching them from some other place in the multiverse. And so, of course, you know, Spider, you know, Billy Braddock is told like, we're going to get you, you know, that kind of a thing. But following that, he basically takes off and he goes to meet with Roma and Saturnine. Now, Roma is the daughter of Merlin, like the Merlin from Arthurian legend, right? Like he's literally the one who founded the Captain Britain Corps, the Starlight Citadel, all that kind of stuff. He's the one that basically spearheaded all those things. Now, while all this is going on with Spider-Verse, you also have the incursions, universes crashing into each other, basically the collapse of the multiverse. That's the first and foremost pressing threat. That's the most important thing, keeping the multiverse from collapsing. But where you end up having like, like literally Billy Braddock who shows up here and tells Saturnine, all the different Spider-Man and Spider-Women across the multiverse are being killed by the inheritors. She doesn't care. She's like, I, that's the least of my concerns. Entire universes are being destroyed. Cosmic entities are vanishing, right? The multiverse is collapsing. The least of my concerns are a bunch of Spider-Man and Spider-Woman being killed by a crazy family. That I have, I have no concern about that. Now, that's kind of the nature of Saturnine. She's just kind of a dick, right? That's just kind of the, the nature of her. She's pretty crass, pretty rude. There's very much like my way or the highway, that kind of thing. Roma was a far more nurturing hand. And that's why she's the one that listens to the appeal of Billy Braddock when he says like, we have to do something about these. And her response is, look, we can't divert the efforts of the entire Captain Britain Corps to basically help you deal with, with you know, the spider totems. I can help you out by giving you a device that'll let you basically travel through the multiverse, but that's the extent of it. Kind of the irony of all this, all the these guys in the Captain Britain Corps, they get annihilated. When they meet the Beyonders, oh dude, the Beyonders just eradicate these guys. And I think it's really more the map makers than the Beyonders themselves, but it doesn't matter, right? Like the, the forces of the Beyonders, these guys get crushed. The only member of the Captain Britain Corps who lives is Brian Braddock from the main Marvel Universe. The Captain Britain Corps never had a chance. And in like a last ditch effort, Saturnine opens a portal. She throws Brian Braddock through it, gives him all the information, and then the portal shuts. And that's the end of the Captain Britain Corps, right? They they never stood a chance. But ultimately, Spider UK is given this ability to basically travel through the multiverse. And this is a huge asset because while he doesn't necessarily have all the resources of the Captain Britain Corps at his disposal right now, he has a lot of experience with understanding the multiverse. And that in and of itself is a pretty big thing because that will go a long way in basically helping the forces of, of uh, Spider-Man 2099 and Superior Spider-Man and all those guys in dealing with the inheritors. Now, at this point, we switch over to our last little tidbit here, which 
is kind of leads into the official Edge of Spider-Verse story. But we basically end up picking up with Mayday Parker, which is essentially Earth 982. Now, Mayday Parker is a fan favorite. People absolutely love her character. She originally appeared in a What If story back in 1997. The What If story centered around the idea of like Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson having a kid and actually being able to raise that kid. There was a point where Peter Parker in that alternate universe basically lost his leg and uh, he ended up retiring. And then once his daughter Mayday started developing powers, he started training her to become a superhero, which is pretty cool. And that's basically what goes on here, right? It's the return of Mayday Parker after a pretty lengthy absence in Marvel Comics. But the whole thing about this is you've basically got one of the inheritors, which is actually Deimos, literally attacking Peter Parker of this reality and then attacking Mayday as well as Mary Jane Parker. And that's kind of the crazy thing is because none of these guys really have a chance here, right? The power of the inheritors, they overcome them all. Now, Mayday was one of those characters where like she was one part fun, but she also had it where it counted. She was the girl you wanted in your corner when things started popping off. She would always try to find a way, right? This girl had like just nonstop optimism. And so despite the fact that it's basically a losing battle, this version of Peter Parker fights Deimos as best he can. But in the end, he knows it's basically just a distraction. His goal is to not actually defeat Deimos. I mean, if he does, he'll certainly be like, yeah, great. I mean, he wants to defeat the guy, but he also knows it's probably not going to happen. Deimos is just too strong, too powerful, too fast. He just, he's just, he's far beyond the powers of just a normal spider, spider person, right? Spider-Man, Spider-Woman, what have you. And so the, the instruction here is actually for Mayday to basically grab Mary Jane and her younger brother and herself and to get out of there as fast as she possibly can, right? To leave. It's Peter sacrificing his life to save his family. And so ultimately what ends up happening is Mary Jane hands the baby, the, the younger brother of Mayday over to Mayday herself and says, get out of here, right? I'm right behind you. Everything's going to be cool. And then Mary Jane seemingly tries to stay to fight. Now, that was always a testament to the nature of Mary Jane Watson. In the early days of Marvel Comics, and when I say the early days, I mean like Mary Jane as a character. When it was Peter Parker and Gwen Stacy, Mary Jane was always kind of there, but she seemed really shallow. She seemed like there wasn't a whole lot of depth to her. She seemed very self-absorbed. And the idea is that when Gwen Stacy died, there was a moment there in the comics. It was beautifully written. There was a moment there in the comics when Peter lashes out at Mary Jane and then Mary Jane chooses to stay. And that formed the relationship there, the, the two of them falling in love. And then it was really like Jerry Conway and those guys that followed suit, reworking and crafting Mary Jane Watson into a person that became a lot more responsible, a lot more concerned, a person that genuinely cared about Peter Parker, which she always kind of did, but she was far less self-absorbed. This is kind of like the, the, the fruition of that, right? The totality of that. What would that version of Mary Jane Watson look like if her and Peter Parker had gotten married, they had a kid, all that kind of stuff. And so that's why the family dynamic of these characters is so cool. Of course, Mayday basically takes off with half of her mind knowing her mom's going to stay behind. And that's exactly what happens, right? Both her mom and her dad are basically killed. There is a bit of hope for her that like Peter Parker survives, but what you end up having is the arrival of the forces of like Superior Spider-Man and those guys to rescue Mayday Parker. And when she's like, well, I mean, it's like, it's like we can go save my dad. Their response is, no, your dad's gone. Like we arrived here too late. Peter Parker's dead. That's when Deimos comes out. It's like, yeah, I absorbed the powers of Peter Parker. He's totally killed. Like there's no one here to save you now. Either you can stay here and die or you can flee as fast as you can, but understand there's nowhere you can go. We will find you no matter where you go in this multiverse. And so that kind of sets in stone this notion or this idea of Mayday Parker to take out the inheritors, no matter what it takes, no matter what happens, she wants to come out on top of this. That's a huge motivation for a character going into the future of the story. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this to an end. God, I love Spider-Verse. It's such a great story. So again, following this, we'll go into Edge of Spider-Verse where we'll get the really, really cool origin stories for a lot of these characters. But thank you guys for watching and I will catch you all later. Peace.